it is true that this is very important, is very uh, relevant, but it is one of the pieces of a greater puzzle. As we we like to use that metaphor because ESPR needs to be understood in a bigger context. So we have the Green Claims Directive or the Powering Consumer Directive on what companies should uh, well can uh, communicate and should not be communicating to to consumers and how to build that trust that we mentioned uh, before on having those uh, precise rules and schemes to really substantiate everything that is said to to consumers. Thank you for all that. It's uh, it's so interesting. So when we talk about uh, eco design and and previously also in in the series we've talked about. Um, greenwashing and, and taking away some of those um, more vague terms that are hard to define. How do we avoid that eco-design becomes another buzzword like eco-friendly, for example? There's a very good question. Um, ESPR should be understood as the minimum requirements for every product. So it will introduce the binding and compulsory requirements that every product should, uh, should uh, met. So that means that it is going to introduce compulsory obligations for, for every product. Like if we refer to recycled content, for example, that a minimum target will be introduced for every product placed in the market to have a certain quantity of recycled uh, content, depending on the fiber, depending on the, uh, well, considering all the trade-offs and, and everything for different fibers, but it should be, it will be compulsory for every product. So it will then be, um, the intention is not to have a buzzword, but to really have, the framework, the legal framework to make all products comply with these requirements. That's why this is such a big milestone because this is for the first, very first time that we are really talking about this for the textile sector at least, uh, to really have all these uh, minimum requirements and uh, obligations to comply with. Yeah, that's uh, completely right. So um, going back to Rosie uh, to, to respond to some of this for a bit, um, this regulation will also boost available product information, and in, in particular, via the um, digital product passport. So how do you see this affecting the transparency in the supply chain? Will it be enough for trust building, you think? <laughs> will it be enough? Um, I think that's uh, that's uh, that's another question. I'll come back to that later. Um, but I would say I am, like I mentioned before, very optimistic about the power of the digital product passport, particularly from this supply chain transparency perspective. I mean, it really is sort of the original core part of the legislation. It's in the name, the product passport, this journey and life cycle. Um, and so I think it really could be a great force to break down a lot of misconceptions that consumers have about, you know, the fabrication of products. And I think there's maybe a little lack of understanding and awareness of how complex supply chains are and how many stakeholders there are in making one t-shirt, you know, how many different places it has to go. And I think uh, the DPP will really break that down um, for, you know, to take an example, I always find it very frustrating. I call it the made in crisis because you have a jumper or a top, it will say a made in Italy, but actually it was made in China, Bangladesh, Ukraine, Spain, France, and then it was assembled in Italy. And um, I think the DPP is really going to shed light on the kind of complexity of this and ultimately in turn make them more, hopefully more demanding to brands for transparency and supply chain. And then those who aren't being transparent and aren't communicating, you know, not only are they having this pressure from policy, which is fantastic, but they're also going to have this pressure from consumers. And I think it's uh, very, like I said, I'm feeling very, very good about it for the moment. Will it be enough? I think it is It is too early to say. Um, but what I will say is in the year and a half I've worked at Fairly Made, you know, regulations have become much more of a centerpiece in industry discourse. And to the conversations I would have with brands at the beginning, you know, a year and a half ago, it was sort of a lot of confusion, a lot of stress what is this? When do I have to do it? And also I got asked a lot, why do I have to do this? Why would I do this? You know, why would I communicate on this stuff and be transparent? And, you know, now it's a completely different story. Uh, people are much more aware and much more up to date on, on what's coming and much more uh, up to date and then, well, aware of, you know, that this is really an important piece of the puzzle. So yeah, to be confirmed, but for now I'm feeling optimistic. Yeah, it's exciting to see how it will uh, apply. 
and it's also an opportunity to to better educate consumers. So, uh, Nate, hey, can you imagine how this law will enable opportunities uh, for the communities in the textile value chain? You talked about the authorship a bit earlier and storytelling as well. And you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Rookie mistake. <laughs> um, I guess it's really interesting to hear these conversations and I like, listen to you both. I'm really interested in how like culture is taken into policy work as well. How that like data and work with people can be qualitative um, and be used to like define the ways that we shape society, which is really important. Like it almost, I guess as free from world, a lot of my work is, is very qualitative and it is around like um, community engagement, it's it's a socially driven practice, but mostly a cultural production studio um, with a focus on like helping people to alter their futures in general, like how fringe communities could, would create a different world. So I guess for me, in terms of looking at this, like what we've spoken about so far, I think um, it would be important to maybe take a step back and like work out what we mean by the word community as well. Um, because a lot of the conversation as we're speaking about it, it speaks towards kind of like people across the supply chain but I guess often for brand heads talking about community is about talking about audience um and so yeah I mean like in terms of like this conversation I think it's, it's really important work and it's really nice to see policy and technological advancements come in because yeah it means that there is an opportunity for the communities um, producing the work to have more equitable exchanges with the supply chain. That is amazing. And hopefully with technologies like blockchain, if they're impl implemented in these processes, there's a complete transparency and ability to see where things have come from so that we can no longer hide these forms of like um, marginalization and colonization ultimately that happens um, as... Um, you know, globalization extracts from the global south generally, um, which I think is really important to address in these conversations around the production of goods. Um, on the other side, though, I think we have a bit of a, a problem to explore. You know, this is the supply side. Hopefully transparency means that like people can't get away with crazy stuff and we'll see how that plays out. But on the other side, I think it's also important to acknowledge that like while we in this room care about policy and we care about like the technological advancements that allow us to like understand where these how these products are produced and where they've come from and they allow us to whip brands into place. Everyone on the other side who consume these products don't necessarily know how to make the best use of these things. And as much as we look for like transparency from brands, institutions, governments, the state of affairs in the world right now also says that like, you know, we can't trust them to make decisions that are gonna reflect our, our needs, um, however transparent or singular um, their messages seem to be. Um, <clears throat> and so I think, yeah, there's a lot to be questioned in the sense of like, as much as, um, we can implement these things to keep brands in place. <clears throat> How do we implement forms of like communication and forms of um, um, of agency into our audiences in order to help them play a role in sustainability? I think a lot of people are waking up to the fact that like, you know, the carbon footprint was designed by British Petroleum, like BP, a major oil company. Um, and so we can't like make the, the plight of, of making the world more sustainable, uh, an individualistic one. Um, but there is a need for us to come from both ways. And I don't think that um, a lot of the ways you've spoken about <clears throat> today um, completely resonate with consumers on the other side. And so I think it's important for us to maybe work out how we can give them a role in making stuff different and coming back to that point of authorship how we kind of allow them to dictate where things go, especially like in, I think one of the few advancements that I'm seeing technologically that I really like about like blockchain and stuff is like the presence of um, communities like DAOs, which stands for Decentralized Authority Organization, which is essentially where a lot of like brands that are popping up in the web free space are um, giving um, decision-making over to um, people within the community so a lot of them are on like discord channels and like are used for like engaging with one another but also allow people to use their voting rights uh, that's gained for engagement to actually dictate where brands move to um, and I think that's really important for us to gauge like how are we 
you know, we could use Web3 and NFTs, which often makes people's eyes <laughs> roll over um, to democratize these things with the technologies that we're, we're starting to see in the present day. But I think there is a really big question to also like, um, like step into a little bit around, you know, like how are these decisions being passed into people's hands um, as opposed to just like um, presented to them as, as, as um what's good for them you know and I yeah, just to uh move on a little bit because we are uh, running out of time sure. um, but it gives a uh, it gives opportunity to um to give voice uh, to to other parts of, of the fashion system um that we we might not uh, see that much and um i just want to remind the the audience that they can post questions and um, we're going to move into the q a um very soon but uh, firstly uh, i want to dive a little more deeper into what communications efforts are needed to to engage one's community really so marina could you briefly um shed some more light on on how to you know empower consumers and what's your experience on this yeah so i can talk from the policy perspective and what has been decided on what is like right now on the table and what is the intention. So we will have, well, Empowering Consumers Directive has already been approved. Now we are discussing everything on Green Claims Directive. But the intention here uh, is that consumers want to know and to have all the data uh, to understand better uh, what they are buying and what uh, companies are doing as well. So here the key uh, bottom line from the two uh, directive is that sustainability now means data because like every claim, every label that uh, is presented in a product should present all the data that allows to substantiate and to prove that what is said is real. So meaning that it wouldn't be, it won't be possible to have a claim without a certification scheme, meaning that it should uh, present all the information explaining why what is said in that label or claim is true uh, to also have um, yeah all the requirements met and to be like completely independent for the brand that is making the claim for example that should be verified by complete uh, independent uh, organs and verifiers and the idea is to take also a more uh, life cycle assessment approach as well to take every time that we make a claim to take into account all the factors involved in in that in, well when when saying uh, those things and also one of the key elements that not only in in the green claims directive or in the empowering consumer directive but also like in the context of ESPR the objective is for companies to really understand products or, or well um, to really have all the information uh uh, related to the products and all the elements and actors in the value chain that are involved to really have that information to be able to provide everything to the verifier and to the certi certification uh, aspect and to really transfer that information uh, from one actor to, to the other. So it's like that um, um, sense of like un having the information and that and visibility on everything that it is involved in the production of a product but also i like be able to have the instrument to transfer all that data and rosie mentioned uh, right uh, very right like the data product passport is going to be one of the key vehicles to obtain this objective because it's going to be like the um, yeah, the vehicle to transfer all this data and to use that not only to communicate with consumers but also with the different actors involved in, in value change yeah mm. Absolutely. Um, and, and Rosie, uh, what do you think about this? You're also muted. Rookie error again. <laughs> um, in terms of communication efforts and what we need to put in place. Uh, yeah. Um, so I would say for me, and sorry if I sound like a broken record, but it goes back to kind of two key elements. Firstly, um, transparency, but also this storytelling. And for me, they both go very, very much hand in hand. Um, and to follow on from what Marina said, you know, the important to, to have a story, to tell a story, you obviously need content and information. And I think that's really a precursor to everything is gaining the visibility and understanding of what's actually happening. Um, gathering data um, is kind of that first step 
And for me in this sustainability space, you know, knowledge is absolutely power. Um, if you don't know what's happening, how can you expect to be better and improve your credentials and and uh, engage your consumers as well? So for me, it's really this sort of knowledge and understanding and then strategy implementation and telling that story from one end to the other and being transparent all, all along the way. Hmm. And kind of to give like a, a, an example from my experience. So we worked with a, with a brand for over two years now. Um, and the first year we worked with them, they, they, you know, they had nothing in place really. They only knew their tier ones and their supply chain, their final manufacturers. And they really wanted to gain visibility um, deeper into the supply chain and gather data. We supported them on that. And, you know, they weren't perfect at all. They hadn't done much in the sustainability space, but they were really um, keen to, to, to change that. And so they used the QR codes and they were communicating. And then the second year, they used that data that we collected to then implement a better strategy and essentially decarbonize their supply chain. So, um, for example, removing aviation from their supply chain was one thing they did. And then that year, they were able to reduce their carbon footprint by 15%. And um, they've now created this identity, which they didn't have before, but this sort of community and identity with their consumers around sustainability. And I think in terms of storytelling, kind of being on that journey with your consumers and being transparent from the get go, it's not about having all the answers straight away. You know, these are super complex topics. It's just about saying, hey, this is the journey we're on. This is where we want to be. And this is how we're going to get there. And I think that's a very powerful sort of storytelling and consumer engagement piece. Yeah, absolutely. It really is. We have some uh, questions for the um, from the audience, um, but Nate, I also want to uh, just give you the opportunity to um, uh, to maybe shed a little bit of light on, on a few examples so from your experience as well as a as a cultural curator uh, and and strategist. And like and like Rosie talked about, there is a this mention of uh, of collaboration. As well, that's uh, quite important. Um, do you have an example to give there? Yeah, again, again, um, I keep leaving myself on me. Um, yeah, I have an example to share. I guess um, during BLM, I was lucky enough to work globally with Depop, um, which is the second hand selling market, kind of the one I guess that revolutionized a lot of younger people getting into buying um, vintage clothes and secondhand. Um, and yeah, like, I mean, just that on that point of authorship and collaboration, they have like networks across Slack channels of sellers on their platforms who are like, you know, the secondary market for them, who are the, the market themselves. And so like, yeah, I think it was really important to see how they were actually able to, to listen and shape their brand based on what these sellers and people we're using their brand to do i think yeah it also connects with like the documentary in this like i guess focus on um indigeneity um i think the key is to go to the people themselves and give them the equity to produce what they need to um because they i from my experience working across like more accessible brands where maybe sustainability isn't something that adds to a price tag um you know like people uh need a better um touch point to yeah. understand these things. Mm -hmm. yeah. We also have some uh, questions from the audience, and there's a few um, that I can maybe merge a little bit uh, that goes to you, Rosie, um, which is how to use, um, you know, this information that, that Nate also talked about, um, about the disparity between the use of transparency in the manufacturing side and, and the consumer side. Um, and how to use this to engage and influence the consumers and create more meaningful dialogue? Yeah, so great question. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I've mentioned stuff already before, so I'm not going to repeat myself, but on, on top of that, I would say harnessing tech actually and kind of tools and transparency tools. I mean, it's kind of amazing the things you can do nowadays um, in terms of engagement, using music and different things that I've seen all over the internet. And uh, as I, again, yeah, going back to, to that kind of straight to the point, 
centralizing and uh, using what you know what's true what's real and I think that speaks to people like what's actually it's not about like the sweeping statements of everything's perfect and everything's great it's just unrealistic and so I think uh, yeah using sort of centralizing uh, centralizing as I spoke about before storytelling and also harnessing tech tools um, to really innovate and communicate in a very sort of exciting way. Yeah, Marina, you have your hand up. Do you have a yeah. thing to add? Maybe, yeah, maybe to complement as well uh, what Rosie was saying about like this like differentiation between communicating like everything like on ESPR, all the requirements and everything, all this transparency to consumers and to micro surveillance authorities, for example. Um, I, I was once in in a conference. I was like one very nice metaphor to explain like how the digital passport um, will work in practice, and I think it was a very powerful metaphor, like to visualize how this would be uh, implemented from the policy perspective uh, at, at least. So it's like imagine like a building, you no, know, with different windows and very tall building with different windows. So like it depends on which audience are you targeting for the digital passport. That one window the one of the other is gonna be. Uh, uh, turning the lights on so like it will depend on who is the target of the data passport like from some information to be activated or like this is storytelling that Rosie was mentioning uh, is going to be like one of the priorities for communicating with consumers but the data passport will also be like this vehicle to for more technical information to all show this like technical aspect to the market authorities as well yeah yeah, and maybe uh, along with, with what you just said, and there's also a, a question for you, um, a, like how can consumers educate themselves about policy implementation and, and choose more eco-responsible uh, brands to shop from? I think consumers are also like very like, they are like educated. It shouldn't be like put like the blame on the consumer and everything like to educate. Like it really is about like having all the information available and it's about like really um because the data that was shown at the beginning showed like how the how the willingness of the consumer to really understand uh what is sustainability and to really be informed about like making their choices. I think um the question will be how to make that possible, how to uh, enable that, how to really bring all this trust on information that uh, companies and we share with consumers and to really show all the data, uh, showing the entire picture and yeah, everything, all the different uh, aspects and values involved to to see, to and well, not understand because the, uh, like to really explain uh, what it what it takes to, to produce the good, yeah. Yeah, so um, as we wrap up the series on, on how to better engage with consumers, I, I also want to end the session with uh, one key takeaway um, that the audience can leave the session with. And uh, in this series, we've talked about sustainability terms and greenwashing and its opposite um, uh, term, green hushing. And we've also talked about overconsumption and the need to think differently about how we value fashion. So. To, this is a question to you all, maybe just one sentence, a key message on how to build trust with one's community um, and in the claims that are communicated. Do you, you want to go first, Rosie, maybe? Sure, yeah. For me, a uh, very, very quick, um, I would just say pick a lane, stick in it and tell a story. And maybe you, Nate, next. Um, I guess I'd say like working within community is a relational thing. It's a relational yeah. practice to build that sort of equity within people's minds and experiences and lives. So spend longer than you need to um, listening and just responding to needs with resource <laughs> and um, and and more like get yeah, truer stories to, to their truths, respond to their truths. And you, Marina? Yeah, I think I will echo what uh, Nathan and Rosie was, uh, were saying. Like, I think uh, I say like sustainability uh, right now means uh, data and to have like gather all this information and to really like, collaborate with everyone involved in, in the value chain and in the ecosystem, like to really have all this data to share with consumers and with all the actors in, in, in the value chain. Yeah. Mm. And um, maybe we can actually, we still have time for for one more question, I think. Um, so let me see if we have here. Um, yeah, there is a, 
one for for you maybe marina again about the policy so considering the ongoing and existing sustainability regulations for the textile industry what's your opinion and how prepared they are and what they should do to prepare themselves brams you mean or um surprise uh, sorry um suppliers um that in the communities uh, that we yeah. talked about yeah I think that is one is a very good question. I think, um, and we always say this: uh, everyone should uh, exchange regularly with everyone to really like make to make this work. We need more dialogue between all the actors and to really like uh, discuss about all the elements that are being discussed and tackled at the moment, and to really. Um, explain what is going to be required uh, and have this conversation, what is needed. I think the key element of all the discussion is what is needed from all the actors to really make this work. And I think that uh, what is what we are trying to do uh, at Policy Hub, but other organizations as well, to really have these conversations to explain what is coming and to really identify what is really needed, like for EU institutions as well, to understand what the, the sector needs and all the actors involved to be really prepared uh, on what is coming. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Marina. It seems like collaboration is a, is a big part of it um, as well. And and also uh, enabling interdisciplinary dialogues. Um, and so thank you for, for those points. And thank you to you all. Uh, thank you, Marina, Nate and Rosie for a wonderful conversation and special thank you to you as well, Laura, and the BBC StoryWorks team for your valuable consumer insights. I, although uh, this was our final session, the content will live on on the DFA website. And uh, stay tuned for a report in the new year, summarizing uh, some of the key points from the series. Um, we will also host a policy masterclass um, as the European election approaches. And uh, next year is going to be really special for DFA because it's been 15 years since the summit was first hosted in 2009 um, and tickets are now live. And I urge you all to take part in what will be a grand uh, edition of the Global Fashion Summit in 2024 in May. And there's more information about this on our uh, website. And um, I hope you can all take a few things for you from these masterclasses that will make an impact in your work and bring you one step closer to your audiences. For more insights on uh, concrete guidance on how to take action on your sustainability journey, the uh, 2023 GFA Monitor is now available to download also on our website or via the link uh, in the chat. And thank you all again and have a wonderful day. And um, you can also watch the Fashion Redressed uh, content um, via uh, globalfashionagenda.org. And uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.